name is Ann Dorney, and I'm here today about what each of us can do to help the insects and birds in our neighborhoods and why this is important. I should let you know that I'm a retired physician, and although I have no formal training in horticulture or growing plants, I have grown plants for years and have had a lot of experience in growing native perennials here in Maine. I also have no formal training in entomology, which is the study of insects, but have been an avid bird watcher for years and love the outdoors. We live in a challenging time where we are losing our insects and our birds at an alarming rate and having more and more species of plants and animals going extinct. Sometimes we think that there's nothing we can do about this, but I hope, you, hope to convince you otherwise. What I hope is that you'll, what you'll learn today is what keystone species, native perennials and invasives are. And I also hope to show you how you can grow native plants wherever you live. More and more studies have shown that we can help our birds and insects and help them increase in numbers again. What we need to do is to start planting keystone species, plant native perennials, get rid of invasive plants, and limit non-native plants to less than 30% of our environment. I wanna repeat this because this is the gist of our discussion today. What we can do to help our birds and insects increase in numbers again are to plant keystone species, plant native perennials, get rid of invasive plants, and li limit non-native plants to less than 30% of our environment. We also need to plant things to help increase the number of caterpillars in our environment. We need flowers that bloom from early spring to late fall to help our insects. We need places for our insects to live in the winter time. And we have to reduce the pesticides which are killing off our insects and caterpillars. Hopefully by the end of this talk, you'll understand what all this means. I am hoping to have a follow-up talk early this summer at Parsons Family Preserve in Skowhegan, where I have been working for the last few years for Somerset Woods trustees to implement my knowledge. One of the key things I want you to understand is the importance of caterpillars to our ecosystems, and I'm sure most of you have never, not really thought about that. If you're worried about the number of birds disappearing, there are several things that are very interesting about recent research. First, our seed-eating birds are not decreasing in numbers, but is the insect-eating birds that are disappearing. Our insects are also dramatically de decreasing, whether they're butterflies, moths, or other insects. There's an entomologist, Doug Ptolemy, who has published many books about this. What he has found is that the number of caterpillars in our environment has gone down dramatically, and that is one of the biggest causes of our decreasing bird numbers. Almost all species of birds feed their babies caterpillars and many, many caterpillars. Some re researchers had the idea to put a camera in front of a chickadee uh, nest and just count the number of caterpillars that a pair of chickadees fed their babies until they flew away. We now know that for one pair of chickadees, they need to find between 6,000 and 7,000 caterpillars just to feed one clutch of babies. That means one nest full. And that doesn't include the caterpillars that they feed the babies after they've left the nest, which until they can find food on their own, often for another three weeks. Just think of the number of caterpillars that you need in a functioning ecosystem with all of the birds that should be living there. Why do birds feed their babies caterpillars? Well, they're soft, they're easy to eat, they're more nutritious than other insects, 
Though parent birds will often find other insects as well, like spiders, aphids, flying insects, if there are not enough caterpillars in the environment. If the number of caterpillars goes down near their nest, there are less babies that they fledge, or less babies that fly the nest, and they lay fewer eggs in their nest. Another problem with birds is that many of them need to migrate. And those that stick around for our main winters need food to survive. Many animals, including birds, also eat berries as part of their diet. And a lot of the birds that stick around for the winter are seed eaters. I don't have time to discuss in detail the nutritional value of berries from invasive versus uh, native shrubs, but there's quite a difference. Birds in the fall need energy if they migrate, or they need energy to survive the cold winters. One study found that berries in the fall that are not native in New England, uh, compared to berries on shrubs that were originally from Europe or Asia, uh, are quite different. A lot of our native shrubs, like dogwoods, have up to 50% fat by weight whereas most of the berries from non-native shrubs have less than 1%. So it's basically a difference between feeding them sugar or feeding them fat, which will get them through the winter or help them migrate. Now let's talk about insects as well. To support insects, including our native bees, just like us, they need a food, a place to live, and a safe place for their eggs, or we need a safe place for our baby or our kids, right? They need nectar and pollen from plants throughout the entire warm season. And that's, I'm just gonna emphasize that because a lot of plants flower in the summertime, but there are fewer plants that flower in the spring or in the fall. So it's very important that they can have food all year round or all uh, warm season. Their eggs also need protection from the cold winter, so they need places to lay their eggs that are safe. Many of them nest in the ground or decaying wood or stems um, from flowers. Sometimes they lay their eggs in the base of plants, like clumping grasses. So if we are going to mow or bush hog an area, it's better to do it in the spring after the first bee hatches, because then you know that most of the insects have hatched. And it's better to leave the leaf litter for the winter and the stems of your flowers for the winter, where there might be insect larvae or bee larvae wintering over. When people think of bees, they automatically think of honeybees. But honeybees actually are not a native species. They're not considered invasive, and we'll talk about the difference between these terms in a minute. You probably don't know that in the US, oh no, in North America, there are 4,000 species of native bees. We need bees, not just honeybees, but our native bees for pollinating our food plants. But bees also pollinate 87% of all plants and 90% of all flowering plants. If we lose our bees, we're in trouble. Just as we talked about, there are plenty of flowers in the summertime, but when insects emerge in the spring, this is a crucial time for survival. That's why no may, no mo may is getting to be popular. So insects have flowers like dandelions, violets, and other early bloomers when they first emerge in the spring. If you don't mow your lawn until June, which means the no mo may. It allows the flowers in the lawn to support our insects. Another crucial time is the fall, since there are fewer, fewer flowers blooming. If you will actually want those monarch butterflies who spend some sum, summers in Maine to actually get to Mexico, the butterflies need to find nectar on their route down to Mexico. Having plenty of fall blooming flowers like goldenrods and asters is essential for them. There are certain plants that are important, important for native bees especially too, like goldenrods, asters, evening primrose, blueberries, and willows. 
So that's an overview of our problem and also an overview of what we need to do. Let's start with some basics so we're all on the same page. I would like to define some terms that I'll be using today. And here's a list of these terms. So hopefully by the, the time I'm done, you'll understand these terms and you'll have memorized them. First, you need to know the difference between a perennial and an annual. So a perennial comes back every year. You plant it in the ground and next year it'll be there. Whereas an annual only lives for that year. So you have to plant it every annum or every uh, year. So think of most, if you look at, the, think of most people's flower gardens, they're mostly planting annuals. Sometimes they're planting perennials in their garden as well that come back every year. Now the other thing that makes it a little more complicated is there's some plants that are actually biennial or triennial, which means that the plant has a two-year life cycle or a three-year life cycle and then the plant dies. But that gets a lot, sort of gets into the weeds and we don't really, that's not that important. So a native species, plant or animal, is from here. <laughs> so basically, the native plants have lived for, for a long period of time with our native insects and our native animals and our native birds. So they've grown up together. So they have adapted together and they found things that they can eat and they provide uh, nutrition for those animals. A non-native plant is from away. But it doesn't hurt the native plants. It doesn't displace them. But it also doesn't help the local ecosystem as well. Now an invasive plant is a non-native plant, but it also displaces the native plants. And that's a real problem. So it's very important to know the difference. It's really interesting. I had a friend the other day who said to me, I was talking about some native plants that I was planting and she said, well, the, I think that plant's invasive. And I said, actually, she was talking about aster, some, an aster. I said, it's a native plant, can't be invasive. And actually, it's a, also a keystone plant, which we'll get to in a minute. So what is a keystone species? I don't know if, you've, if you know what a keystone is, but if you look in at um, arches or bridges that are made out of stone, the central stone is called the keystone. And the reason for that is if you pull out the keystone, the arch collapses. So when they talk about keystone species, that means that that plant is key to your ecosystem. When you're thinking about, so research has found that there's certain plants that provide a food for a majority of our insects and other bugs. And these species are key to their environment. Not having them reduces the quality of your ecosystem. So planting keystone plants in areas where they're missing is crucial to benefit our birds and insects. There are also keystone animals. So one example, for instance, out west in the prairies is bison. Um, when they reintroduced wolves into Yellowstone, they found that wolves were really a keystone species. So keystone species can, is not just plants, but we're just gonna talk about plants today. According to Doug Ptolemy, who we just talked about, the entomologist, who's done a lot of research, 5% of local plant species support 70 to 75% of butterflies and moths and other insects. As a result, having keystone species can be very helpful for the abundance, abundance and diversity of your ecosystem. Without keystone plants, the food web falls apart. Ecosystems without keystone species have 70 to 75% percent 
fewer species of caterpillars than landscapes with keystone species. So what we can easily do is plant some keystone species where, wherever we live. And we'll talk about the, what I'm doing. So next I want to talk to you about how perennials grow, or the cycle of perennials in Maine, since we live in a cold environment. So the plants need to have a strategy for making it through the winter and coming awake in the spring, and the seeds need a strategy for surviving the cold. What this means is that the top of the plant may die off in the fall when exposed to the cold, but the roots are deep enough to survive the cold winter, and any seeds that the plant has produced will fall to the ground, stay dormant for the winter, and then figure out when to germinate or sprout again in the, in the spring so the plant can start growing after the cold weather is gone. So the other thing you can do is you can fool Mother Nature, and we're going to give you, show you some examples of that, and get these plants to grow sooner if you like. You, so let's just think about what happens to the seeds naturally. For instance, some seeds will germinate regardless of what you do. You just put the plants and the, the seeds in the ground and they'll come up. But that may not work for many native perennials, at least if you live in Maine. Many seeds that grow, many seeds from the plants that grow around here have to have exposure to the cold in order to germinate in the spring. In other words, the, the seeds, if they fall on the ground, unless they're exposed to cold, will not grow. So you can tell the seeds, you can sort of pretend and expose the seeds to cold yourself. So most seeds need a one to two month period of time to be exposed to the cold in order to germinate. And some seeds also have to be exposed to moisture in order to germinate. The other thing is some seeds have a very hard shell around the seed, and unless that shell is broken somehow, it will not germinate, even if it's exposed to the cold or to moisture or to both. The most common ways for seeds to be damaged, to actually damage that outside shell, is for an animal to eat the seeds, or eat maybe a berry that has the seeds and then poops out the seed. So the digestive system um, damages the shell. Or sometimes just exposure to, to freezing and thawing through the winter will damage the shell enough so that the plant can grow. You can do this artificially by something called scarification. So you basically scarify the seeds before you plant them so you do something to weaken the outer shell, which can be done with sandpaper, files, knives, nail clippers, and I'll show you some of those, tech that, uh, what you can do. You can also propagate some plants by cloning, which means that the babies that you get, that you're going to plant, are the exact genetics of the parent plant. So it's sort of like you're creating identical twins. There are pluses and minuses of all these techniques. So I, and I'm not going to be able to get into all the details. If you plant a seed, each seed is genetically different from the next seed. So you, if you have a changing environment, or if you planted it in a place that maybe one seed will grow, the other one might not. Maybe it's a little bit too wet, or maybe it's a little bit too dry, that kind of thing. So some seeds will survive better in the environment if you have more genetic diversity. If plants are cloned, which means they're all the same, there's less biodiversity since you're planting the same plant over and over. So it's genetically the same. So if the um, soil is too dry, chances are none of them will survive. Most plants raised in greenhouses these days are cloned, which limits their biodiversity but it does make it cheaper, and it also makes it easier for people who want all their flowers the same color, for instance. 
The most common way for ordinary people to clone plants is by doing plant cuttings. And so we'll talk about that as well. Another thing to think about when planting native plants is that plants with a large tap root or a central root often don't transplant well. So when you're growing a plant, you know, these are some plants that I'm growing. So these are a plants that I'm, what I'm gonna do when the plants get bigger, and I'm, I'm actually gonna put this plant into a bigger pot so that by the time I plant it out, it'll probably be in a pot that big. Some plants, however, don't transplant well, so you're much better off just planting the seed in a large pot to start with. And we'll talk about some techniques for that. Most common thing that I've used for planting things like acorns, which is a seed of an oak plant, or chestnuts, is using a cardboard milk carton. And it works quite well. I watched a YouTube video about this and was like, whoa, very nice. So I'll show you how to do that as well. So let's look at some of the plants that I'm growing this year. I am currently growing 21 different native perennials, and that doesn't include some of the shrubs that I am growing as well. But let's, go, let's step back a little bit. Let's go back to the stratification, cold stratification. So if you remember, cold stratification means that we have to expose the seeds for usually one to two months in your refrigerator is the best, is the easiest way to do that if you're gonna do it, if you wanna plant something early. And sometimes the seeds need to be dry, cold stratified, and sometimes they need to be moist, cold stratified. Now the easiest way to plant native perennials, almost no work, is this. So this is a tray. I filled it with potting soil in the fall before the winter. It has to have drainage holes in the bottom, otherwise it stays too wet because you can, it's gonna rain, it's gonna, there's gonna be snow, the snow's gonna melt. So if you have too much water, then the, the seeds are gonna rot. But all you do to plant is you take whatever plants you're growing and you just put them in, the, in this. A lot of native perennials, the seeds are so small that you don't even bury them. You just sprinkle them out and you pat them in. That's all you have to do. If it's a little bit larger seed, then you might just barely put it into the ground. But the problem with this, if you just put it outside like this, is that the birds are coming to my bird feeder will find these seeds too and think it's food. The squirrels that like to be in my yard in the winter time, they'll eat those seeds. So you have to do something so the seeds don't get eaten if you want some plants to come up in the spring. So the easiest way to do that is put some kind of mesh on top. And I have like these plastic spike mats that I use, but you can do like metal mesh you can get at any hardware store. I put it on my picnic table and then I tie them down various places with string and that's, I just let it sit for the winter. That's all I do, very easy. And then in the springtime, of course you're not, you're not gonna have germination probably till April or May. In the springtime, things will start to come up. And once you get seedlings that are big enough, then you can put them in pots and put them somewhere else, so leave them outside. Um, so basically what you're doing is just allowing the seeds to grow in their natural environment. So that's one of the easiest ways to get native perennials to grow. The downside is that you're not gonna be able to plant them out probably till the end of the summer. So if you want plants to grow this year, it may not work very well. So pluses and minuses. So let's just, I'll just show you some examples. So one of the things I like to plant every year is common milkweed because that's one of the plants that monarch butterflies like, right? So common milkweeds 
have to be cold stratified with moisture. So this is what you do. First you have to take the seeds off the white parts, the, you know, the fluff that goes in the wind. And then basically you take a moist paper towel, not real damp. Then you just spread your seeds out on the paper towel. You fold it up and you stick it in the fridge in a Ziploc bag. I'll usually put the date on it. This one I started cold stratifying December 22nd because I know common milkweed must be one to two months right? and I'm not planning to plant it for another week or so. And you just stick that in the top of your fridge or wherever you want in your fridge and then you're done until you want to plant it. So by the time you plant it, it should germinate. It's had its cold stratification and its moist cold stratification. So here's another one. Here's actually two. So I have swamp milkweed, which is another milkweed. I now have four different milkweeds growing on Parsons Field. So you can look at, here's the paper towel. Oh, interesting. I have not looked at this since this fall. So sundial lupin is a, an ex considered an extinct plant in Maine. So I try to plant some every year and last I counted, I had 41 of them growing on Parsons. Now the interesting thing is it has a very hard shell. And so this plant usually has to be moist, cold stratified, and it has to be scarified. But some of these seedlings, as you can see, have already germinated. You can see the little roots. I don't know if, can you see that? You can see the little roots coming out. So those I can plant any time. The, the seeds that need to be scarified we actually have to do something to damage that outside thing. And what, the, what I usually do is take a file from a nail clipper. And you take one of these seeds and you just hold it in your hand. You take your nail file and you just file it. You want to just go through the outer coat though. You don't want to damage the inside of the seed. So you just do it on the outside coat, and then you have to immediately plant it because if you do not plant it immediately, then it will not grow. But having, but having it be scarified then allows, allows it to, to grow. Now, some plants, so you, one thing I want to tell you, this is another flat, this, these uh, trays are called flats. So this is a flat that I grew inside. And one of the things you can tell the difference is I actually have a plastic bag around this one. I don't have drainage holes because I'm gonna have this inside for the winter. I, have, I cold stratified these seeds and I can't remember whether or not they also needed moisture. I'd have to look that up because uh, I don't remember. But I planted a plant which has tiny, tiny seeds called grape blue lobelia in this tray. So all I did was I sprinkled the seeds, I patted them down, left them in my living room near the window, and you can see all the seedlings that are coming up. I probably have 300 seedlings right here. They're very, still very tiny. But the interesting thing about great blue lobelia is it's considered a critically endangered plant in Maine. And I just read an article last fall that said they think it might actually be extinct. It is a glorious plant. And I have about 150 of them growing on Parsons Field and I have another about 50 at home that I, that I planted in the woods quite a few years ago. It blooms for about two months every summer. 
The bees love it, the butterflies love it. This is a absolutely glorious plant and it's very easy to grow. So that's one of the plants that I try to grow every year if I can because it's critically endangered. So the more we can introduce this into our environment, the better. So remember how important it is to use keystone plants? Well, this is called the New England aster. I actually have three different kinds of asters growing now on Parsons. One has grown there naturally, um, and there are thousands of those. So I've grown the other plants and established them. And this is a glorious aster. It's actually a fairly common aster in the fall, but it is a keystone plant. It grows about two feet tall. I was able to save seeds, both from my lobelia, which gave me the seeds for this, and from my New England aster, which gave me the seeds for this. This plant, when it's blooming, is covered with butterflies and bees. Every plant you go to, there'll be like six butterflies. It's remarkable. And it's, it's one of the last things that blooms on Parsons Field in the fall. And it's just, they're pink or purple, that's just a glorious plant. So that's one plant that I try to grow every, the, every year. Another plant that I'm growing is called butterfly weed, which is another kind of milkweed. And, but it has orange flowers. If you've ever had seen butterfly weed, people always say what a gorgeous plant it is. And it's amazing how many bees and butterflies are attracted to it. There'll be this whole field of flowers and they're just going in for the butterfly weed. So it's a, it's a really nice plant. It's not considered a keystone plant, uh, but it is a Maine native. So let's talk about, so we were talking about cloning. So guess what? I like to have some plants that match in my yard. So one of the things that I do every year is I save some of my impatience, bring them in for the winter, the, my favorite colors. And then I do some cuttings and then I put the cuttings, I put the cuttings in water and then once they root, then I plant them. And guess what? Then I can have a whole series of plants all the same color. But it doesn't give much genetic biodiversity, right? Because they're all the same uh, DNA. So pluses and minuses. So here's another series of cuttings that I did. So these are mostly begonias. Again, I like to have some of my flower garden. So you can see all I did was do cuttings, and the general rule for cuttings is that you should leave enough stem for at least two sections before you cut. And then you, then you can just stick it in water, and you can see that all of these have little tiny roots, so they're all getting ready to plant. I can plant them any time, and I don't know if you can see that easily, but these are ready to plant. And then I basically just keep doing cuttings. Every few weeks, I can do more cuttings. Have another thing of water. Once I get, they get roots, I plant them out. And then I can have some begonias in my flower gardens too. So let me show you what I'm doing here. So here's cuttings, but we're actually doing cuttings of native shrubs. Remember when we talked about the berries that have had high, that were high in fat? Well, one of the, that study, one of the berries that was high in fat were dogwoods. So here are cuttings of four different kinds of dogwoods. And I'm probably not gonna be able to tell them apart until they actually leaf out. And you can see some of them are starting to leaf out. Dogwoods, you can do cuttings early in the spring. Some shrubs, some native shrubs like viburnums, you're not supposed to do cuttings until after they've flowered. So you can't do it till like June usually. But dogwoods you can do early in the spring. It's very easy to root. And I'll show you a trick. First I'll show you that I actually have, some of these are actually developing roots and I don't know if you can see that very well. But here's one dogwood that has a, has a nice root right here that's growing. And I have another one that I saw the other day. Let's see if I can find it again. 
this one, I think. I don't know. Not easy. Only can show you one. I don't know if you recognize this plant, but one of the, so this is a pussy willow. And most of the pussy willow buds have fallen off, so that's why it's hard to tell. But if you remember, willows are a keystone plant. And so getting willows to grow in your environment is very helpful for your environment. The other nice thing about willows is they're very easy to root. In fact, what they say, which I've only tried once and have not been successful, is you can do a cutting of a pussy willow or any willow in the spring before, you know, when you just see the buds. And if you have a wet area, all you need to do is stick it in the ground and it'll root. You don't have to do anything else. But the other nice thing about willows is that they secrete a, a rooting hormone into the water that you put them in. So if you want other plants to root, like your dogwoods, you're much more likely to get them to root if you put them in water with a willow. So that's what I do. Last year I raised about 40 dogwoods from cuttings. And again, I want as much biodiversity as possible. So you don't want to take them all from the same plant. You want to take some from maybe up the road your, in your driveway, and you want to take some you know, a couple miles away, and then you want to have your neighbor get some cuttings or your best friend. So it doesn't hurt the plant to take cuttings. For dogwoods, I can tell you that they recommend that a cutting should be at least six inches long. And again, you want at least two spaces. Now, you, so theoretically, you probably could do two cuttings on this particular. You could cut this here. That would give you two. And that would give you two here, but barely. So you might be able to get two cuttings out of that. You don't know for sure. Not all of the cuttings will take. But boy, I think we had about 90% that actually rooted last year, and then we planted them out. We, mostly we removed invasive plants, and then we put in a native shrub in its place. So if you remember from my lecture, the most important tree that you can plant is it oak? As I remember, there's something like 652 species that can live with oaks of insects. So if you're going to do anything for your environment and you have a place to plant an oak, plant an oak tree. Now, I was very lucky because one of my squirrels decided to plant to put all the acorns that they found into my potting soil for the winter. So I have a whole collection of acorns, which I'll probably put out this spring, or maybe give away. When you, if, you're, if you really want to plant an acorn, what you just do is, is put it in a thing of water, and any acorn that, that drops to the bottom is good to plant. The acorns that float are, are not going to germinate. So that gives you an idea. And if you have something, remember we talked about planting something with tap roots? A good trick for that is a cardboard carton. And the easiest way to get that is milk carton. Again, you have to put the holes in the bottom because you want this to be able to drain, right? Otherwise your seed is going to rot. So you fill this up with soil or potting soil or compost from your garden or whatever you want to plant it in. And then you plant your acorn. Actually, they suggest planting acorns sideways. It probably would grow anyway. And then you just wait. And the, the, once you have your seedling tall enough that you want to plant it, 
Again, you have to cover it so the squirrels don't eat the acorn. So you want to, might want to cover it with mesh or something like that. But because now when you're ready to plant it, that root's going to be this tall. If you damage that root, the tree may not survive. So I have done this with oaks and I've done this with chestnuts, but you can do it with any plant with a large taproot. When you want to plant it, you dig your hole. You put, you put the whole thing in the hole just to know what the size is and how deep you want to put it and that kind of thing. And then what you do before you plant it is you actually take a scissors or a knife, cut one side off and cut the bottom off. And you peel it back and now you're ready to plant. You stick the whole thing in the ground, then you pull the carton off and it's ready and it's perfect. You just cover it up with soil and then you don't damage the taproot. So that's a very easy way to get a plant to grow that has a large taproot. So I hope that's helpful for you. This is just the beginning of what, you know, you can learn. So one of the things that I want to talk about is just how you can find more information. And one of the things that's very helpful in the state of Maine is a nonprofit called the Wild Seed Project. Their headquarters are in the Portland area, but the Wild Seed Project does several things. It has volunteers collect native seeds from plants in Maine they sell native seeds and plants so people can plant them. And the, the profits that they get from that help the nonprofit. So one of the things that I have done for the last several years is collect seeds from Parsons Family Preserve for seeds that the Wild Seed Project wants. Because I have some plants on Parsons that are extremely unusual. And they're native seeds. One of them is um, a small native grass called little blue stem, which is a grass that's part of the prairies out west. Uh, so it's interesting because I've only found, myself, I've only found one other place in Somerset County that I've seen it growing naturally. And I have thousands of those plants. So that's one of the plants that I collect for wild seed, the seeds I collect for wild seed project. Another one is there's an aster that's on Parsons that's very unusual uh, that grows in very dry places. And so I tend to collect that. Sometimes I collect some other seeds for them as well, but there are people across the state who are collecting seeds depending on what they need. They also have webinars on how to plant seeds, they have question and answer sessions, they have all kinds of things. So if you, if you go to the Wild Seed Project website, you'll find all kinds of things if you are interested in doing this. There's also a nonprofit, which is called the Native Plant Trust, used to be called the New England Wildflower Society. And they have a very nice website as well. And they also have something called Go Botany. And one of the things that I use a lot is the Go Botany site. What the Go Botany does, so you can go to the Native Plant Trust or you can just Google Go Botany, and it will actually tell you if you have if you see a plant and you're trying to figure out whether it's native or not, or you're thinking about planting a plant and you don't know if it's native or not, the Go Botany site will actually have maps of New England and will tell you whether this plant is a native to wherever you live. So I do that all the time. I go to, I go to the GoBotany site and I say, oh my gosh, this is a great, you know, New England asters, butterfly weed, whatever it is, um, the dogwoods. Uh, I can tell whether or not that's native to Somerset County. Sometimes I will plant things that are native just south of us. And one example of that, there's a shrub that I just planted called um, New Jersey tea that's just that's native just south of us. It's supposed to be incredible for bees. And with change, the changing environment, we might be getting warmer, as you can tell from our warmer winter this winter. So sometimes planting a few plants from slightly south of us might be beneficial. 
So there's also the National Wildlife Federation. And the nice thing I, if it, with, about native plants is very nice is they actually have lists of plants like in different parts of the country. So you can do like New England for us. And it will basically list the plants and how beneficial they are for the insects in your area. So it'll, it'll be the keystone plants probably first. And then it'll say, you know, like the native perennial sunflower, like the 10 petal sunflower, like that's top of the list. But the ox eye fall sunflower, it's slightly down, but it's very good. So if you're trying to figure out what plants might be good to plant, you can look at that site and see how beneficial it is for your insects. Then there are lots of books on this subject. So I brought a few that I really like. One of the people that I talked about is the entomologist Doug Ptolemy. He has several books on this subject. He has a book that just came out just about oaks. And I forgot to tell you with the oak planting that you actually have to plant two oaks of the same species in order to have acorns and to be the most beneficial. Now, in this area, some oaks are very common, like red oaks, but some oaks are very uncommon. So I was able to find some white oak acorns, for instance, this year. So my plan is to plant two at a time, or more than two, if I plant them in an area, because you're gonna have the most benefit. So he has, Doug Ptolemy has several books. Um, they're fascinating. And they also have, periodically, there be webinars and things like that. If you ever have a chance to watch one, it's, it changes your life. I mean, as far as, uh, I found them absolutely fascinating. And a lot of the, the stuff that I quoted, the research is from him. So this is a book that I have read front to back at least three times. And the nice thing about this book is it was written by someone who grew up in Mercer, Maine. So that's really fun. He's actually a landscape architect who now lives in Western Massachusetts. But what he does for work is he mostly tries to use native plants in the environment. And one of his books <coughs> is called Lawns and is um, maybe his only book, Lawns into Meadows. So if you have, for instance, a field that you want to turn into a meadow with, nati nat with native plants to help your butterflies and bees. This is a wonderful book and you can ask your library to get it or you can purchase it if that's helpful for you. But that I really used that. I planted half an acre of native prairie plants and it seems hard to believe that Maine has native prairie plants, especially in Somerset County, but we do. And it was fascinating to read that book. Very helpful. So we talked about the Wild Seed Project again. Wild Seed Project has several small books that you also can get. <clears throat> I think if you become a member, you get them for free. I can't, don't quote me on that. So one of, they have books on like native ground covers for, they have books on native shrubs. So if you are trying to figure out, well, what kinds of shrubs might grow where I am? You can go through that book and you can say, it tells you how tall they grow and whether they like the sun and whether they like the shade and how, you know, how moist the soil can be. So it gives you some ideas for what you might be able to plant. It doesn't have all the shrubs, but it has a lot of them, which can be very helpful. So that's my story. And I'm hoping that at least this year, some of you will get some acorns. If anybody needs some, let me know. Um, try to plant one keystone plant in your environment if you can. Now, sometimes it's hard to find native plants. So that's, so if you're going to grow them from seed, that's easy because then you can grow them from seed. Won't, you won't be able to do it for this year. One of the things that Wild Seed Project also has is a list of um, greenhouses in the, in the state of Maine that sell native plants. So the last time I looked, the closest one was Dover Foxcroft. And they, don't, they sell non-native plants as well. But that gives you some idea. I know at one point I wanted a plant um, that I could, could not grow. And I found out there was a, they, through the Wild Seed Project, that there was a um, nursery in Vassalboro that had this plant. 
So to make a long story short, the lady lived in Augusta. I actually met her in Augusta and got the plants that way. <clears throat> the other thing to think about, what I do is when I go to our, my local nursery and I see a plant, I'm trying to figure out whether it's native. Sometimes it's labeled as native, but that doesn't mean it's native to Maine or to Somerset County. It might be native to the US. That's not really what we want. So what I do is I just pull out my phone, I go to Go Botany, and I put in the name of the plant, and then I, it'll actually tell me with a map whether or not this plant is native to Somerset County. And then I know whether I can I feel good about purchasing this plant. Thank you so much for listening to this lecture. I hope it was helpful. I am, as I mentioned, I think at the beginning, I am a board member of Somerset Woods Trustees and a volunteer for this property on, in Skowhegan. If you have questions, you can always contact Somerset Woods Trustees. Um, they will probably be able to help you or they can give, uh, give me your contact information. I'm happy to respond. We are thinking about having a talk on Parsons Field this summer. So if you're interested in attending, you can also let us know. Thank you so much.